500 registrations from over 6,000 companies. They also represent more than 160 countries. This clearly shows us that cold fusion is far more prevalent than people perceive. Last year was a challenging year for the team where we got used to the new normal of working from home. We have been confronted with creating and adapting to new ways of learning, working and living our lives amid stresses that we had never experienced before. But the year also brought out the resilience and creativity in most of us. The engineering team is working towards the next release of Cold Fusion, which would complete the cloud strategy that I spoke about during the last summit. We are looking at ways in which we could help our customers adapt to the challenges or take advantage of the features in the cloud. The team was busy the whole year and we shipped four security updates to Cold Fusion 2021 and 2018. We also got Mac OS Big Sur certification. We did upgrade our Tomcat to 9050. And the best, we addressed more than 150 bugs reported by our customers. CF 2021 server and API manager accessibility compliance based on VPAT version 2.4 has also been released. In sync with our cloud strategy, we have shipped brand new Docker image for Cold Fusion 2021, which is now available at Docker Hub as well as on Amazon ECR. I'm also happy that our customers are finding value in the features that we have delivered till date. As we exit 2021, I'm happy to report that the Cold Fusion business continues to do great and has grown by 20% year on year we were able to add more new customers to the ecosystem than ever before. This would not have been possible without the constant support of the community or partners, resellers and developers. Thank you all for your trust in us. Next year, we will launch the Cold Fusion Builder plugin to VS Code and launch Cold Fusion as a virtual machine image on Azure, among other things. We will talk about it in more detail next year. So next year also promises to be an action-filled one for Cold Fusion. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to thank the content committee of Brian Klaas, Dan Wilson, Alicia, and Mark Takata. Because of the hard work of these awesome people, we will have two days of exciting sessions. I sincerely thank all the speakers for their effort and energy and time in spreading their knowledge. A special thank you to all our sponsors, Foundio, Fusion Reactor, Hostec, Lucid Outsourcing Solutions, Mitrasoft, Media3, Ortus Solutions, Techversant, TerraTech, CoLS Solutions, we are grateful to all the sponsors for taking out the time for investing in our event. Your sponsorship has enabled us to organize this event at such a scale. And now, let me introduce our keynote speaker for today. I am thrilled to have Ashley Willis for the keynote. Ashley is a globally recognized speaker and technologist, a certified Golang Google Dev expert she has dedicated her career to working with open source committees. She currently serves as the Director of Developer Relations for Microsoft Azure. Please join me in welcoming Ashley to CF Summit. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ashley Willis and I am super honored to be here. Today I wanna to talk to you about developer relations, the past, the present, and the future. But first, a little bit about me. My background is actually in photography, graphic design, and web development. And I spent most of my 20s running a photography business. And by 30, I was so burnt out that I never wanted to touch an SLR again. So I started exploring other career opportunities. And to make a long story super short, I found developer relations. It's been 10 years now. And today, I lead a team of developer advocates at Microsoft. 
One thing I hear often is that developer relations is a new discipline, but there's actually a three decade long history. Developer relations was created by some of the most influential technology companies in the world. Apple formalized the title and built such an effective evangelism program that Microsoft had to respond. Microsoft, however, created a successful program of their own, but they had different philosophies and core principles. Then the World Wide Web became pervasive, enabling eBay to invent new categories of platform. More recently, startups and smaller companies have started employing developer relations programs, and we can learn a lot of lessons by examining how these companies approached and defined the field. And I will admit that I did not know a lot about the history of developer relations until I started building this very talk. And I certainly did not expect Microsoft, my employer, to be the villain of this story. So imagine how awkward these next few minutes are going to be for me. This is a rough timeline of developer relations, starting with Apple coining the term in 1982. Guy Kawasaki, who was arguably one of the most well-known evangelists in the industry, published a book called The Macintosh Way in 1990. In the book, he talks about how Apple approached evangelism early on. Then in 1992, Microsoft was dominating the market and their success was heavily powered by their developer relations program. But some of the shady tactics that they used ended up getting them into a lot of trouble with the government. Turns out Monopoly is not just a board game. And as a result, some internal Microsoft documents were released, giving some very interesting insight into how Microsoft thought about developer relations at the time. In 1999, Salesforce almost invented developer relations online, but they didn't really know how to support it. Ultimately, it was actually eBay who created modern API-based developer relations online when they launched their developers program in 2000. Then in 2007, the Plum and Don papers were published and the details are pretty shocking. Steve Wozniak is actually one of the first tech evangelists. And when Apple was just starting out, they had not only the task of selling hardware, but the idea of having a personal computer in your home. But the public was not exactly ready for that. Even in 1984, only 8.2% of households in the United States owned a computer. But Woz was determined and he understood the power of a passionate community. Apple itself was a result of discussions at a local computer club called the Homebrew Computer Club. And when Woz debuted the Apple One, the first place he showed it off was at the club in front of his peers and Steve Jobs. Passion and curiosity were Woz's main motivation for starting a company. And before they started Apple, Woz and Jobs both approached Atari and HP looking for funding. They offered to give the technology away in exchange for the ability to take a salary and keep working on it. And while Woz was a developer evangelist with his cool inventions and impressive demos, Jobs was a visionary. He wasn't exactly technical, but he was a passionate futurist. Jobs believed that design and technology could improve the world. He would say, I wanna put a ding in the universe. And anyone who didn't subscribe to that vision were non-believers. This culture is evident with early Apple employees as well. They believe that they were building something important, something larger than themselves. They all thought they were going to change the world and arguably they did. Apple now has some of the most fanatical followers of any brand. In 1982, Apple was nowhere near the dominant business that they've become. Though they were an early player in personal computing, the IBM PC was the new kid in town and taking over the market that Apple helped invent. Apple knew that the success of their platform depending on winning the hearts and minds of developers. Nobody would buy a computer that didn't have a good selection of software, but developers also didn't have any incentive to create software for a platform with no installed base. So in order to persuade developers to build for the Macintosh, they formed a new team. Apple hired Mike Boich in 1982 as the world's first official on paper software evangelist. Guy Kawasaki, who was Mike Boich's college roommate at the time, joined the team soon after. Guy set the foundation for Apple's evangelist program and later became the chief evangelist at Apple. 
Kawasaki is a successful author, startup founder, investor, and he's actually still a software evangelist today. In 1990, he wrote a book called The Macintosh Way about the Macintosh team at Apple and how they did things. Apple wasn't a startup in 1982, but the Macintosh team had a startup mentality. They had a small scrappy team, an ambitious goal, and a lot of trust and autonomy. They had Steve Jobs air cover. However, the Macintosh launch in 1984 was not successful. There was little software available and ultimately Steve Jobs ended up leaving the company due to this failure. But the mix of autonomy and resources were fertile ground for a progressive idea like developer relations. And this ended up being the key to Apple's return to success through the 90s and beyond. How did the Macintosh team think about developer relations? And in Kawasaki's words, the essence of evangelism is to passionately show people how you can make history together. Evangelism has little to do with cash flow, the bottom line, or co-marketing. It is the purest and most passionate form of sales because you're selling a dream, not a tangible object. Kawasaki says when you evangelize people, let a thousand flowers bloom. Don't close down opportunities for unknown people or small companies by concentrating on the obvious and established ones. Although the reference to Chairman Mao was questionable, I do agree with Guy's approach. The old adage of invest in people who invest in you is not great advice for developer relations. Instead, assume everyone has something to share and give of yourself without expectation. Your company's next top customer might just be two people with an idea when you first meet them. Take nobody for granted. This doesn't mean ignoring established customers. Developer relations can and should help those customers, but developer relations professionals should be specialists rather than top level line of defense. They should support the teams that focus on retention. If a customer has questions or feedback about an SDK or an API endpoint, then we should be there to help. But taking the long view requires trust. In an environment where success might be month to month, if not week to week, companies must empower their DevRel teams to make investments that might take years. A great piece of advice from Kawasaki is ask for forgiveness, not permission. When red tape and corporate policies get in the way, do the right thing and ask forgiveness later. A boss once told me you will never get in trouble for doing the right thing. Try to think of yourself as the CEO of your own position. Make bold choices and spend the company's money as if it were your own. And empowering your employees is a good way to run just about any team. But it's critical to the success of developer relations because so much of what we do is opportunistic. To be effective, we must be empowered to make decisions we believe are in the best interest of the customer and the company. A trust first environment is one of the keys to building a successful developer relations program. So what are the guiding principles your newly empowered employees should live by? One of the most important is to be an advocate for your customer. If an evangelist sees customers having trouble with a product in the field or online, it's our responsibility to communicate that issue to the rest of the team. Doing what's right for the customer is the easiest value to agree with, but it's also the hardest to follow because doing what's right for the customer can sometimes be scary. For example, software companies are absolutely tortured by the decision to send out bug notices because they worry that it will ruin the reputation of their product and decrease sales. If there's a support issue, then an evangelist knows that a vocal and angry customer is more valuable than one that churns out without saying anything. Those angry customer rants can actually turn into actionable feedback and an opportunity to win them back. The investment that Apple made in evangelism paid off in the long run. Developers were and still are the lifeblood of the platforms that companies like Apple, Microsoft, and IBM provide, but Apple was winning the battle for their loyalty. Now here's where it's going to get a little bit awkward for me. Microsoft began to feel the effects of Apple's evangelism efforts. According to Alex St. John, who was one of Microsoft's first evangelists, he said, Guy's efforts at Apple had a devastating impact on Microsoft. 
Developers hated Windows, hated Microsoft, hated Microsoft tools, and loved anything Apple did in large part because of Guy's incredible evangelism talents. When people think about the history of Microsoft, one of the first things that they think of is a sweaty Steve Ballmer bouncing across the stage, clapping his hands while shouting the word developers 14 times in a row, while also trying to get the audience to chant along with him. And let's not forget the time he called Linux a cancer. And while these examples aren't necessarily part of the history of developer relations, it does help paint a picture of how Microsoft handled communities, especially developer communities. And because of the way that they handled communities, there are some developers that no matter how much Microsoft has changed, and we have, they will never trust us again. Developer relations was a natural extension of how Apple approached business, but it was way less natural for Microsoft. Early in Microsoft's history, Bill Gates sent a letter to software hobbyists who were sharing copies of Microsoft software. He said that there's very little incentive to make this software available to hobbyists. Most directly, the thing you do is theft. And this did not endear Microsoft to the community. Microsoft had been skeptical of hobbyists and community efforts. Instead, they saw developers as either a way to gain leverage or as potential customers. They had found a successful business model by charging PC distributors a fee for the basic programming language. This was good for both sides of the marketplace for reducing costs, but came from an analytical business sense rather than goodwill. The Microsoft Developer Relations Group had actually been around since 1984, but when they saw the success of Apple's evangelism efforts, they decided to increase their focus on developer relations to gain even further control of the market. Alex St. John joined the Microsoft Developer Relations Group in 1992, and he said that Microsoft's version of developer relations was somewhat different from Apple's. Microsoft's version was extremely aggressive, ruthless, and essentially had a blank checkbook to wield against its adversaries. And unlike Apple, Microsoft's program was not run as a startup, and they did not have the limited resources of the Macintosh team. The Microsoft approach was to win the short game and invest their winnings in maintaining control of the market. Leading the team at the time was James Plamondon, and according to St. John, James was one of the first evangelists and considered Kawasaki to be his personal nemesis. And in 2007, the comms versus Microsoft antitrust case resulted in the publication of a series of documents known as the Plamondon Files. These files contain the handbook for evangelism during Microsoft's market control from 1992 to 2000. They lay out all the aggressive and ruthless tactics that Microsoft Developer Relations Group trained their people to use. The tactics described in the Plamondon files are dirty, deceptive, and selfish. They favor the company over the customer, and the tactics are combative and high pressure. The Macintosh way focused on long-term goals and doing what's right for the customer. But the Microsoft way focused on manipulating customers to maintain market control and maximize revenue. Like Kawasaki, Plamondon was fond of war metaphors, and they appear throughout the training materials he created. He references Sun Tzu often and describes the software industry as a battlefield. And who are we at war with? The customer, of course, and more specifically, the ISV or independent software vendor. Among his shady training materials, Plamondon says focus on the traveling salesman aspect of evangelism. The purpose of the exercise is to close, to get the mark, the ISV, to sign on the dotted line and pen. And how do you get the customer to sign? You do whatever it takes, including selling them a lie if necessary. Plamondon also trained his crew of evangelists to engage in targeted espionage. In a document instructing people how to deal with competitors at an event, he says, get their junior engineers alone, get them drunk, and pump them for everything that you can get, giving them nothing in return. Obviously, this would not fly today. Microsoft was not interested in helping developers. In this example from the Effective Evangelism presentation, he says, we're here to help developers. 
But what he really meant was that they were here to help Microsoft. In the same presentation, he outlines the role of the ISV. He says that they're pawns in the struggle. Today's allies, tomorrow, who knows? They're valuable pawns, though. We can't win without them, and we must take good care of them. They can't feel like pawns. Treat them with respect as you use them. Plamondon encouraged these tactics because they were effective. Microsoft was crushing their competitors and had almost total control of the market. He didn't see anything wrong with this approach either, but according to Alex St. John, James was an extremely nice guy, likable even. For him, technology strategy was a giant competitive game of chess with Apple that he didn't consider diabolical in the least. It was just competition. The Microsoft approach to developer relations in the 90s did not come from a place of empathy. It came from a calculated capitalistic desire to dominate their competition. It was a direct and vengeful response to the success of Apple's program, but there were consequences, beginning with the United States versus Microsoft antitrust suit in 1998. Most of the advice in the Plamondon files were self-destructive and sacrificed long-term goodwill for short-term gain. However, a few pieces of advice did make sense. For example, never say anything bad about anyone or anything. Try not to stink and be especially nice to our competitors. And sometimes there's good advice from Sun Tzu sprinkled in as well. Like, don't start fighting until you can identify when you've won. Behind the combat metaphor, the suggestion to set goals and measure progress is valuable. And despite their ruthless tactics, the Microsoft Developer Relations Group did actually do some incredible things scaling their outreach efforts. They invested in resources and discounts for developers via the Microsoft Developer Network Program. Microsoft tooling was widely available, well-supported, and cheap to use via MSDN. MSDN shipped 100 million CDs between 1993 and 1998, and almost half a million developers went through Microsoft training in 1998. I remember helping my dad study for his MCSE during that time. Scale came at a price, though, and Microsoft spent almost $630 million on evangelism that year alone. But in the late 90s and early 2000s, things started shifting, and the fallout from the dot-com bubble was looming over the tech industry. Microsoft was in the news a lot, but not for many good things. Yet personal computers were well on their way to becoming terminals to access the World Wide Web. With the expanding capabilities of the web, new kinds of platforms were possible. The dot-com bubble had wiped out many companies, but it had also gotten a lot of people comfortable with the idea of buying and paying for things online. Consumers were starting to buy books from online stores, and the level of comfort the population had with online payments was rising. A sea of change was coming, but eBay had more than weathered the storm. They had disrupted the market with a new platform. In 1999, eBay was an internet legend. An online retailer valued more than Sears, Kmart, and JCPenney combined. eBay spent several years growing a successful online two-sided marketplace and faced competition from both Yahoo and Amazon. But they had a significant lead, so they made a move to capitalize on their position. eBay recognized a new potential growth and direct revenue channel when they launched their developers program. This was the groundwork that would solidify their position as not only a successful retailer, but also a pioneer of the web. On November 20, 2000, the eBay API was launched. All at once, eBay had invented the API platform, the developer relations portal, and developer relations for an online platform. Their portal had everything that a modern developer relations portal has today, like the API, SDKs, sample code, an online forum, and a developer sandbox. From a historical perspective though, Salesforce deserves the credit for beating eBay to the API punch in February 2000, but it took too long for Salesforce to realize the need for a forum and support. 
A Salesforce exec was quoted saying, early on we struggled with a way to explain the API. We knew it was important, but SaaS wasn't truly an accepted concept yet, and our API was initially confusing. Further, we made mistakes of limiting availability by charging a significant fee and restricting its use to companies with proven revenue. We realized that those barriers made adoption difficult. Once they nurtured a community, things began to work. Providing easier accessibility and additional educational opportunities proved to be the right move. Before long, there were more users, more activity, and more transactions moving through the Web Services API than there were through the application. In terms of significance, though, eBay gets the credit for being the real innovator in terms of APIs. They were the first to do it well. While eBay was the first to do it well, it was not a stroke of luck that eBay landed on the idea of building and empowering developer communities. Pierre Omendyer, the founder and CEO of eBay at the time, spent the early part of his career working as a developer. And in 1994, he went to work for a company founded by former Apple employees called General Magic. Then he joined their developer relations team. His experience at General Magic showed him the value of the web and the value of engaging developers to grow a platform. In his book, The Perfect Store, Adam Cohen wrote, my job was to help third-party software developers write software that worked with the Magic Cap platform. And eBay was upfront about their strategy from the very beginning. In their launch announcement, they said that by openly providing the tools that developers need to create applications based on eBay technology, we believe eBay will eventually be tightly woven into many existing sites, as well as the future of e-commerce ventures. They also knew exactly what kind of opportunity they had in front of them. An executive told the Wall Street Journal, I think of it as the enabling platform for e-commerce and they were intentional about how they positioned the product. They used the API and the eBay developers program in the same way that Apple uses the App Store today. It was a way to create a safe environment for approved use cases and establish a bar of exclusivity, and it worked to an incredible degree. There were roughly 2.5 billion calls to the web services APIs monthly in 2005 and almost half of the traffic on eBay came through these web-based applications. At the end of 2005, about 21,000 developers had registered for the developers program. eBay also knew that developers were scraping their listings and building scripts to automate certain functions. They understood that there was no such thing as a non-public API, only an unofficial or undocumented one. So instead of trying to deploy countermeasures, they found a way to monetize it, and they didn't anger the hackers who were building scripts and bots by shutting them off. Instead, they offered a path to legitimize their builds. Rather than being defensive, they embraced the creativity of their early adopters and provided a platform for building even better applications. This increased the number of listings on the platform and increased the number of tools to help buyers find and bid. Their online platform enabled a new channel for growth. Much like the Apple and Microsoft platforms, this platform enabled entire businesses to exist. And eBay was happy to let people build service layers on top of their product beyond extending the platform via the API. For example, in 2005, a company called Auction Drop was basically an eBay consignment center. A customer would deliver an item to their facility and Auction Drop would authenticate it, list it, photograph it, and run the auction. Then they would collect the money and send you the proceeds. In some cases, eBay was enabling people to become self-employed, start businesses, and live a new kind of life. They weren't only showing developers how they could make history together, they were helping people realize those dreams. For modern developer relations professionals, eBay has defined our profession as much as Apple or Microsoft. They invented the modern developer platform as well as the core channels and strategies that are the foundation for much of the work that we do today. Now let's talk about the present. There's a lot of debate around what we should call this role. Is it developer relations, developer advocacy, developer experience, techno evangelism? The roles vary company to company, but we all essentially do the same thing. We represent software developers. 
We do this by building internal and external relationships to remove friction from a developer's workflow and create positive experiences. And while we can't agree on what we should call it, we can agree that it's important. Companies like AWS, Google, IBM, Facebook, Microsoft, Twilio have all made some pretty heavy investments in developer relations. And because of this, the developer relations role has gone from a niche nice to have to a business critical linchpin. Even so, the roles and responsibilities of a developer advocate vary from company to company, department to department, and community to community, making it one of the most misunderstood roles in this industry. If you're already working in developer relations, then this will be familiar to you. But if you're just hearing about this role for the first time, I would like to take this opportunity to clear up some common misconceptions. One of the most common misconceptions about this job is that we are not developers ourselves. This is false. Most developer relations professionals have a background in software development. Most of us contribute to open source, and many of us are even active maintainers, meaning that we know when a product is or isn't easy to use, and we also know how to fix it. This involves all the usual development activities like architecture, design, implementation, testing, and debugging, resulting in tools that make your product easier to use, like SDKs, code examples, CLIs, and IDE plugins. Meaning that we are not just professional conference goers. However, public speaking is something we have to be comfortable with. There's an art to explaining highly technical concepts in a way that anyone can understand. As a developer advocate, it's really important to be able to articulate why your product and its ecosystem is the best place for a developer to spend their time and energy. Because the roles and responsibilities of a developer advocate vary so widely company to company, I decided to write a blog post in 2017 trying to clear up what it is that we actually do. And that post made it to the front page of Hacker News. And that is my actual personal nightmare. I don't want to be on the front page of Hacker News. And when this happens to my friends, the first thing that I tell them is, do not read the comment section. But the problem is that I am terrible at taking my own advice. So I read every single comment and I read the mean ones twice. But the thing that I learned is that the ambiguity of this role leads people to make wild assumptions about what we do. And the comments range from genuine curiosity all the way to pure rage. Some people insisted that we were merely Instagram influencers being paid to fly first class from event to event reciting marketing scripts. The ambiguity around this role have not really helped with the negative perceptions. And while spending time in airports and hotel rooms is fun in small doses, it becomes way less fun when you're taking your fifth conference call from a noisy airport terminal and paying $15 for a sleeve of bruised fruit and plastic cheese. Not to say I don't appreciate the opportunities that this job affords me. I am super privileged to have a job that enables me to experience new places and meet new people, but it's not always glamorous. Now that we've cleared that up, let's talk about what we actually do. When I'm not in an airport, I'm spending anywhere from 20 to 50% of my time learning new things because staying technically relevant is a really important part of this job. And I don't know if you've learned a new piece of technology lately, but it's super overwhelming. The reason it's so overwhelming is because technology moves faster than our imaginations. We invent one breakthrough technology today and tomorrow's developers turn it into something else. This has always been true, but it's happening even faster. One of the great, but also kind of hard things about developer relations is that it literally touches every part of an organization, from recruiting to marketing, engineering and product, the list goes on and on, which means that we do a lot of stuff. But if I were to make this as simple as possible, I could break this down into three categories, content, product, and community. First and foremost, we are content creators, 
but the definition of content varies. The most common types of content that we produce are product announcements, end-to-end -end reviews, getting started guides, and documentation. But regardless of the type of content we're producing, the goal is to enable developers to build better applications faster. And arguably the most important piece of content is your documentation. Your docs page is one of the first experiences a developer will have with your product. And if you want them to stick around, onboarding needs to be painless. And I'm sure everyone here has been the victim of poorly written documentation. So you understand why it's so important. Documentation has the power to make or break your product, full stop. And some of the lowest hanging fruits are your getting started guides, because if those aren't clear, you'll likely lose that user. Producing getting started guides, reference documentation, and detailed API docs are par for the course in developer relations. We offer a much needed fresh perspective because when engineers are building documentation, it's easy for them to focus on the details of the tech and lose sight of the very developers that they're building these products for in the first place. I know I'm really hammering on the importance of documentation, but it is important. And it's also the most universal example of the type of content that developer relations professionals make. And an even better example of why it's important is taking a look at Stripe. Stripe isn't incredible because it sends developer advocates on the road to every conference. It's incredible because it creates world-class documentation. That said, the type of content your developer relations groups produce will depend on where your group sits within an organization. If you roll up under marketing, you're top of funnel, which means that your content is tailored more towards driving awareness, signups, and engagement. If you're in product and engineering, then you're primarily driving product feedback and your content is tailored towards a specific audience to gather insights and create feedback loops for the product teams that you support. Which brings us to the second pillar of developer relations, which is product. At Microsoft, the developer relations group is an engineering function, which means I spend a lot of time with engineers building out community features and product teams to ensure that the needs of developers are being met. Making a product easy to use has its challenges though, and you're not always going to get it right the first time. One of the first indications of a problem is when users start asking for help about some aspect of your product. It's a core component of our job to be active listeners. The way that we listen varies from community to community, so being subscribed to the right issue trackers forums and QA sites like Stack Overflow are key. And you don't necessarily need to answer all of the questions right away. Give the community some time and space to figure it out for themselves, but try to actively listen because those questions can often point to underlying issues. Being a developer advocate means lending a helping hand when people need it the most, or meeting people halfway when the product is missing the mark. And to be in a position where you can facilitate this dialogue takes time and trust. Our job is to cultivate trust from both the product teams and the developers that we represent by reaching across the table, listening, trying new things for ourselves, and understanding context and roadmaps. It's our job to embolden this trust by being clear and authentic and highlighting the things that might have otherwise gone unnoticed paving roads where there are none. This means being a true advocate for your community. And occasionally this will upset people within your organization. And then we go back to Kawasaki's advice, ask forgiveness, not permission. Which brings us to our third pillar, community. Being part of a community makes us feel as though we're part of something greater than ourselves. It gives us opportunities to connect with people, to reach for our goals, and it makes us feel safe and secure. A true community is about being connected and responsible for what happens, not just watching, but actively participating and making a difference. Engaging in developer communities takes time and consistency. And the reason it's so crucial is because having an active community means there will be far more help to go around 
than you or your product team could possibly provide. And the people who use your product are sharing valuable tips and tricks and experiences. It's almost like seeing Amazon reviews for your product. It's confirmation that there are real people using your product and that they appreciate it. That said, it's not just about building external connections. The community that you build internally is just as important because collecting feedback is the easy part. Doing something about it is much harder and requires internal stakeholders to implement. My product teams know that when I bring them feedback, it's been prioritized. I'm not just delivering everyone's grievances, but the more that we connect with community and the more people start seeing their feedback being implemented and become part of the product roadmaps, the more valuable that investment becomes. Ultimately, companies who prioritize developer feedback and engage authentically within developer communities will wind up ahead. The simple act of actively listening and implementing feedback will create better or superior products. So what's the future of developer relations? The developer relations role will continue to grow because there's real value in helping organizations understand how their culture and the way that they communicate can contribute to their success or failure. And while speaking and writing will always be core job responsibilities in DevRel, the future is increasingly digital and building resources that can reach a global audience are essential. Like it or not, hybrid events like this one aren't going anywhere. And while you can't replicate the hallway track for your virtual attendees, there is actually real benefit to keeping the hybrid model moving forward. We need to overcome the obsession with being at every single conference and every single meeting in person. Being able to attend a conference in person is a privilege. And some people may not have the time, money, or support to be there in person. So providing a virtual space where anyone, no matter their situation, can learn is just the right thing to do. And because every hybrid event has the potential to reach a global audience, there's greater inclusion of attendees, more diversity of opinion, which leads to deeper and richer discussions. The word inclusive is so important. The tech industry is more distributed than ever. With incredible hotspots around the world, we're going to need to massively grow developer populations worldwide to meet the challenges that we face, which means better education, better engagement, and better support. Finally, a hybrid model offers a sustainable connection. Traditionally, the only way you could attend an event was by going in person, resulting in traveling long distances and staying in hotels, which have adverse effects on sustainability and accessibility initiatives. Whether you believe the hybrid model is the future or the new normal is entirely up to you. Hybrid events offer a new way forward, but they do come with complexity. For example, had I known how much time and money I'd be spending on recording and editing video content, then I would have invested in a small production company. This is my first virtual keynote, and it has been so much harder than any of my live sessions. During a live session, people expect you to make mistakes. In fact, it's even sometimes charming. I enjoy it. But in a recorded talk, there's kind of an expectation of perfection. I have spent countless hours working on every single detail of this presentation, from the content to the illustration, to editing out my ands and ums, to writing a script. The amount of control that I have over this talk is actually maddening. I have spent more time on this talk than any other talk in my career. And don't get me wrong, the goal is always to deliver high quality presentations, but having this much control is actually crippling. This online first approach has certainly been the biggest shift in developer relations over the last 10 years. And learning how to carry big messages in keynotes and workshops is a skill in itself. But in today's online world, it's crucial that we know how to break that content down into small bite-sized chunks that an audience can consume in their own time. Take TikTok, for example. I am simply a consumer of TikTok. It serves me funny cat videos and I fall asleep with my phone in my hand. 
we have an agreement. But my friend Scott Hanselman is using it in a much more advantageous way. Scott discovered that TikTok is actually an excellent platform for teaching and learning. He has built up over 100,000 followers by teaching people to code in 60 seconds or less. It's actually really brilliant. The developer audience is looking for fast to implement solutions, and you should be able to deliver those in a way that's precise, concise, and valuable. And TikTok is proving to be a great place to do that. Developer advocacy is actually a really small community. And Kelsey Hightower once said, same team, different companies. And I love this. It's actually kind of become our mantra. A developer advocate's job often blurs company lines. And this is one of my favorite things about the job and the community. No matter what you work or what you do, somebody is always willing to help. When I was doing my research for this talk, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't making assumptions based on my experiences alone. So I asked the developer relations community on Twitter how the job has changed. Not every company is willing to give you the tools or training you need to be successful in this new AV world. And I predict that these skills will be a big part of the job descriptions moving forward while other people like myself have embraced it. I am really enjoying this online first approach. I get to spend more time than ever with my family and that is important to me. But the greatest thing to come out of this online first approach is the global reach. And we're just now seeing the impact of this. We also know that we're going to need to massively grow developer populations worldwide to meet the challenges that we face. The pandemic has been a forcing function for this online first approach though, and is really setting foundations for a new way of working. With more work online, we need to build better metrics and KPIs to ensure developer advocates can do great work and have better, less stressful lives, more time with their families. Some of the industry changes we're currently making, even if they're being forced upon us, will be better for us in the long run. Every business function is being affected from sales to customer service, to marketing and product management and logistics. We are all in this together, but focusing online first will enable us to be more inclusive and accessible as an industry. And that is important. The bottom line is that developer relations isn't going anywhere. It's been one of the most adaptable roles in the industry and how it will grow with this online first approach remains to be seen, but I think that we have a bright future. I want to thank you for spending this time with me and I hope you learned something because I really did put a lot of time into this. I'm in the chat. If you have questions, please ask me and have a really great rest of your conference. Hello everyone, I'm so happy to be here. I really hope that you learned something today. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I've seen that some people have said that hybrid events have leveled the playing field, but is there anything else that I can help answer today? All right, well, thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your conference.